until we deal with the hierarchical system of what counts as knowledge and how knowledge is produced, which is really an epistemological question, you cannot really talk about equitable partnerships. I'm going to the next slide. So my, my impression of all these processes was that we had all been zoned for a purpose. So one, we had to be part of the American architecture of peace and culture. So any a PhD applicant from the continent, however wonderful you are, if you did not tailor your theme to that, you lost out. Okay. So it made sure that people tailored, but also in tailoring, it also generated a certain kind of ecosystem of knowledge around these countries. Mm -hmm. Tanzania always missed out because, you know, Tanzanians are peaceful people. They have never really had conflict. Three <laughs> 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 years they missed, they, I think two or three years, they missed the, the funding and the US was hard on us. Elena was hard on us because like, Tanzania must be in, you cannot. So I remember we even had to organize workshops to make sure, how do you get Tanzanians? to think about conflict. If there's any Tanzanian here who says to get an SSL funding, just because you were not uh, <laughs> There's also a time Ghanaians missed out for two years until they had to go to the election and electoral bias. Because again, they would also do things like queen mothers and caring for children yeah. and farming cocoyam and the trade around cocoyam. So those things don't take you far. <laughs> Next slide, please. Next slide. The, move, I think. the next one was the new heights program, and Ugandans will know the new heights. This was the Northern Uganda Health Integration for Enhanced Services. Mm. It was the effort that was supposed to help restructure Uganda's healthcare system in Northern Uganda. We had a 26 year old war. And after that, they, all the donors and all uh, the donors and all our partners were concerned about making Uganda, Northern Uganda catch up with the rest of the country. Those of you who have visited Bulu University it is actually it was in the area which was the epicenter of the world. So New Heights was funded by USAID and was being implemented by Plan International. And it happened to be there at the time we were also doing a, a, a project funded by DFI. And it was a 50 million USD project that was supposed to be five years. And uh, these are the things it used to work on. Our concern by then, because I was on health systems research, was that it's not looking at things like suicide. And at that time, we were really concerned about suicide because we're told statistically, if you have three suicides a week in a particular area, that is significant, statistically significant because it's a rural area. So, and there were so many, I mean, local explanatory models on why they were having suicide. But anyway, yeah. these people told, you said, told, you said boss in Kampala told us, by the way, I can report to the American Congress how many people I put on HIV treatment, how many we tested, how many mothers we saved from dying, and how many children we immunized. How do I tell them that we saved three people from committing suicide? Thank you. Well, we are not going to commit suicide the following year. Thank you. <laughs> Anyway, at the end of the day, once we were, one time we were in the field and we came out of the town hall angry because someone had flown in from New York to address this people in the New Heights because it was good as well organized because the leadership of the district managed the post-conflict health, whether health or social response. They just didn't want anyone to come and play around and go. So all these things, there used to be a health meeting, every Monday meeting, with all the players, government, and government players, and they all knew what we want. So one day we couldn't have them in our meeting early because they were in a meeting being addressed by USAID. And what happened? The person from New York had flown in to terminate the New Heights program. So this is a program which was very fundamental to people's recovery on the health grant, but it was terminated because USAID and Plan International had quarreled in the US. Mm. And people are not told. So you call, come in a meeting like this, this a car comes in, the person yeah. comes out, mm -hmm. reads the ultimatum, and leaves. So people are like, you know, they told us where we went wrong. Mm -hmm. You should have evaluated us. Yeah. But nothing occurred. Anyway, it ended that, and more than 90 staff lost their employment. And of course, you said, Kampala said, we are going to think of a way to do contingency measures. Of course, from a citizenship perspective, Uganda government will say, Uganda government, you need to take over your things properly. 
as I'm always relying on foreign news. But can we go to the next slide? Next slide, please. And my conclusion of that experience was when donor interests clash, yeah. interests don't matter. Yeah. So we are, we are happy we are here today to discuss some of these things. How we have equitable partnerships. The first was to actually show you how, depending on which partner you have, you'll leverage different resources. Yeah. The second was to, what was the second one? <laughs> yeah, the, 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 this last one shows you that actually you can be dropped yeah. in yeah. the process. Yeah. The other one actually shows you that you all fit within a, a particular ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And you can either change that ecosystem or you can sustain it. Mm -hmm. The issue, the entry, the, Concern is what is in it for you. Can we go to the next slide? So those were three stories, okay? Mainly, these are the contextual issues that govern what we do, okay? African universities, I know there are some NGOs like Lenin, sorry, I forgot about you. I didn't know you'd be here. <laughs> but you see, how do you become internationally credible vis-a-vis -vis being locally relevant? That's the challenge being put to us as researchers and as academics on the continent. So this creates an identity crisis for us, <laughs> academics and researchers. You want to be like your colleagues wherever they are, but also they are saying these things don't matter. Of course, African governments also have the same challenge. How are they responsive to donors and how are they responsive to citizens? If the World Bank is saying privatize before we give you aid, and the citizens are saying we want food coupons, we want healthcare, we want free education, where do you lie? But mainly to so show that the development context is permanently evolving. We have issues we carry from colonialism. Independence came on board with so many African thinkers. Thereafter, we actually lost them. Most of the period from shifting development paradigms and especially neoliberalism, we've done a lot of mimicking and cutthroat competition, whether as universities or as researchers or as NGOs, we are looking more towards the funding than being independent thinkers like the Chinua Chebeza and the Nyerere and those people who thought Ujama can go. And what I'm saying here is, even if you don't take anything from here, just know that we work in a system where there are hierarchies everywhere. Mm -hmm. There are hierarchies of knowledge, hierarchies of actors, hierarchies of researchers, funding. I mean, in Makere, it matters whether you are NIH, whether you're gifted, or you're just under mm -hmm. government funding. Okay, we know which donors give money, which donors really give peanuts, which donors give peanuts and are very restrictive with their funding, and sometimes people even don't bother there. But also even among the academics, I mean, there are many Ugandans here, you have, I can say, my PhD is from the UK. <laughs> and you say that, no, it's from the UK, and then, then oh, I went to Middleton, and then to Michigan, and uh, of course now the Makere are also being asserted, yeah, my PhD degrees are from Makere. Okay, okay, yeah. Mine is from the UK. Okay, so <laughs> this at the end of the day do create certain ways we conduct ourselves and whether we're going to be equitable even among ourselves as staff. <laughs> of course, there are hierarchies of knowledge production, was it? Did you use the positivism way? Did you use the interactionist way? Was it anthropological? We know if you're an anthropology, you tell stories. For us, we really talk with hard data, not soft data. You also have much and some gift. Mm -hmm. And we shall talk about that later, interlocutors, ethical review. Now the trend they think in Uganda is to have an ethical review committee. Mm -hmm. In the past it was about ethics, but now it's also about money. Mm -hmm. And some of the powerful ethical review boards will charge as much as $800, $1,000 to clear your proposal. Mm -hmm. But where do you get a younger researcher? who is a junior researcher, an undergraduate student, a master's student with that kind of money. And because they don't have those kinds of things, of course now in the university we are largely operating at $300, but then at the end of the day, you, they will not really be understood by the gatekeepers they're finding because they don't have ethical clearance. We talked a lot about publications, the group of publications is that. I worry each time. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> Okay. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay, five minutes. Let me see. I'll stop where to stop. So basically, just is just to say that the African university is an extension of the colonial system, of Western education system, and that in a way privileges epistemologies and philosophies that come from the Western world. That, that's why even when we write, you have to first do a theoretical framework and a hypothesis that 
quote some big white yeah. thinkers, yeah. okay? Then you add on how the Africans respond, the Asians and Africans responded to that. Then you are diverse. If you don't have that, people think. So whose concepts count? Whose language and jargons of academia? Are you in an index or a non-index journal? You may have Dar es Salaam Journal of Social Sciences, but is it on MedLife? Is it on PubMed? Is it on, I mean, where is, is it on Scopa? Is it in Elsevier? So if it's not indexed, I mean, even your students will not cite it. So Africa largely is an outpost, even when we are scientists. Yesterday we debated, take, I think it was in our group, taking tissue samples out for analysis because there's no infrastructure. Our governments haven't thought of putting infrastructure there. And so our partners have the infrastructure. So you keep, so what kind of balancing does that introduce? Because even the donors also don't want to put in infrastructure. So can we move on to the first? <laughs> this one is just an illustration of, you've all heard about the story of how different people thought differently about elephants. Mm -hmm. But it is also used in some of these hierarchies where the elephant is black and everyone foreign is trying to understand this case study. So you come to Tanzania and you come to a place like this and you study community and say Tanzanians are like that. Then you go to Uganda, you go to one village in Western Uganda and say Ugandans are like that. But can we move on? <laughs> This is basically the hegemony of Western Sudan. And I thought it was important to talk about it because it's where our governments are. They have gone to the West, they have seen development, and they have concluded the reason Africa is underdeveloped is because we are not scientists. They have wasted time with humanities. So what does science tell us? Knowledge is objective and value-free. Context doesn't matter. They are universal principles. Western knowledge is scientific and African knowledge is not. Uh -huh. So humanities should be set aside. But of course, when you read writings of people like Nyam Kropitanyamjo, they talk about how education with no values is irrelevant because it does not speak. So we, this keeps us permanently aping and playing catch up with the West. Of course, the, the question for tangible outputs here, so you are in gender studies, what is out there? When your friend is delivering something which is innovative, there's a product for you, you just have an idea. And of course, the the whole issue of saying the West, the South is, is a secondary consumer of knowledge. Because permanently <laughs> uh, you're being told, do not reinvent the wheel. You've already done this thing. So take the prototype and deal with the prototype quickly. This one was just an issue of merchants and interlocutors. When we talk about gatekeepers, we tend to think of only the traditional <laughs> leaders. Yeah. Yeah. We've had cases in Uganda where actually donors also control communities. Like for a long time, we couldn't go where UNICEF had been because one, it pays heavy motivation for research. Mm -hmm. So you want to do a focus group and say, what is your plan? Because for us, this looks more. And you, I was a master student there. And they were saying the, the lowest we can take is 5,000. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that. It's more prominent with the refugee setting. Of course, we have the government controlling refugee setting, but also you have big donors controlling refugee setting. So they are not going to allow anyone to do research. So in short, you have our spaces zoned as research communities, but you have to navigate your way in. You have to negotiate sometimes with foreign governments. Sometimes it is foreign governments controlling other governments, other countries, and dictating who can come in. Of course, now we are being told don't allow in the Chinese. And I hope that will be successful. But beyond <laughs> that, <laughs> you're also being told now, don't allow in this people to behave like this. So if you do that, so they control communities, they control countries, and those who claim to understand and speak on behalf of others. Mm -hmm. So for me, Uganda, I'm the expert on Uganda. Mm -hmm. You just go through me. Okay, please, we move on. How have these affected research? Initially, we had research on the African, like we had the elephant. Then re research, I mean, African researchers, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, reproduction of the native as the other <laughs> for very much anthropological knowledge, perpetuation of stereotypes. Research now is being done with the African, and we are saying, can we research? Cannot be done by that. But until our government is put in, you'll see that challenge later. Mm -hmm. Evolution of research in Africa, anthropology, where Africa was studied, the merchant gatekeeper, the African researcher, the research assistant, then as a native informant. And we are happy that we are here today as partners. Okay, we move on. What do we, okay? How do we level the ground? 
One is locating the research in the site of inquiry. And I'm happy that for most of the studies that are being done here are being done in the context. There's something of added value by locating in the setting and by writing about the setting, even when you're citing the most credible thing. But most importantly, capacity building, investing in training people that has been well done by this team. Grantsmanship is another thing that came up in our group, but which is important. Sometimes it's not enough to be a researcher. You also have to know how to fill in the Excel sheet, the report, financial reporting template, the narrative reporting template, and each donor has their own financial and narrative reporting template. Capacity building, infrastructure development is where we have a problem. No donor now wants to invest in it because they already have the infrastructure. They only want researchers here, but can we consider that? Financing, we have national and the, now we have PIs from the West Trust. Can we be trusted with the money? But also, can we be trusted as equals? So that we are not just, today we are pushing log frames, tomorrow we are pushing fear of change. So the knowledge is coming for us. Can we have a setting where even knowledge can come from? Co-production of knowledge, research consortia like we have here, we've done well. Co-creation of knowledge with you and from the margins. And this is beyond this classroom. And we come up with a one capture knowledge from the community. Mm -hmm. Once people don't write, just people don't read. Move on very fast. This one was just to say I cannot go without with just complaining. These are the things you're doing very well. And I read your report. So so thank you for that. But what more can be done? Having a, a balance between global competitiveness and local relevance, we need to rethink that even more. Mm -hmm. Supporting open access journals. I put this one there because to go open access, you have to take it. One time I needed, if you don't go open access, your people will not access. Mm -hmm. So the journals are not available, mm -hmm. their books are very expensive. Even when our libraries buy, they don't buy everything. But to make your journal open access is not under $1,000. I remember I had to pay, I think, £2,500 to make my chapter open access. In okay. Then convey, and now no donor who pays for open access. So if we put them where it's not open access, then your students will not access. The data. So can we be helped to come up with journals in whichever countries and universities you're coming from? And also non-conventional research method. This is for all of us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> for your presentation. And I'm glad that I know the reasons why my proposals turned out. Okay. Have 20 minutes and then I'll give you five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's a pretty tough act to follow. <laughs> Sarah. And the fact that she took some extra minutes mean I can reduce mine yeah. in order to keep balance in the universe. Yeah. But that's uh that's fine, my move. Um look, thank you. Um to the organizers for um, the invitation for me to be here. I think this is a really important program. I think it's a, a little drop, drop in what needs to be a big bucket or ocean, and perhaps the beginning of discussions um, in many ways. But um, I think it's important. It's been terrific so far. I've learned a lot from all of you already. So um, I think you've had enough information about me in the, in the bios, but there's a couple of things that are important to note about me before I say why I think I'm stood here. Um, first, that I work, I'm an associate professor of global studies. So my work is more in the peace and conflict area, peace building and how it meets with development study. And I work for a, a, a university in Australia and uh, RMIT University in Melbourne. Um, but I also have a role with the United Nations, um, where I work for a think tank within the UN system, within the United Nations University, actually. But it's a policy think tank within the UN system. And the intent is to provide policy advice, drawing on findings from empirical research to inform UN policymaking for big 
um, kind of flagship agendas, including the Sustainable Development Goals and, and so on. Um, both of those institutions, though the UN's a bit of a messy, complex thing, as we all know, but they they sit predominantly, despite efforts to the to the country, in the so-called global north. So I think one of the things, as um, as Vivica said in the introduction, is that I'm both an outsider and a northerner. And so some of my um, remarks today will draw on the fact that I do critical peace and conflict work. So I'm interested in um, how power relations manifest in the generation of knowledge um, and its application to practices in peace building and development. So that's something that I think is relevant to this. Um, but my work's not directly on these issues. I'm not a scholar of decolonializing development studies, okay. for example. I experience these issues through my work. It's not that my work is, is on this issue. So I'm not like Consolata, perhaps, or even Sarah. Um, but whilst I am a northerner, so to speak, I'm not a Dane. So I think that's where I'm coming <laughs> from as well. Um, I am a northerner in so many ways. I'm from England originally. Ah, okay. And in, in the UK, I'm from Hull, which is in Yorkshire in the north. And there's a big north-south divide in the UK, right? So I'm in a pejorative way. I'm northern when I'm in England, but I'm northern in some other way as well. But I think we can be clear, despite my best efforts with my Ghanaian brothers and sisters here to become a bit Ghanaian, my other name is Kwame, it's <laughs> true, but nevertheless, I, I am situated, my positionality is what it is. Um, but I'm also not funded by Danita or other day. So I can speak with some independence, perhaps some safety. I can speak truth to power, perhaps, or at least I'll try to. Um, but we shouldn't forget, as uh, Soren reminded us yesterday, that um, I'm also a recipient. Um, I receive funding from Northern donors for partnerships, which I've been part of actually, have led with um, institutions in, in Africa, particularly, but also in the Pacific uh, and East Asia. So I have some experience in working with donors as well and understanding some of the challenges. So often I'm between, I, it's more of a north, north, south configuration. And I'm often managing up with donors, trying to make sense of the nonsense that they put forward to all of us, but also sometimes mediating between partners in the south and the donors. So, um, I want with the rest of my time to react, a to do three things. So you can move on a slide, thanks. To react a bit to what was said yesterday and what people have said from this lecture and so far. Second, to add something from this non-Danish Northern perspective, um, acknowledging as um, Helena mentioned yesterday, but as many have raised that these categories, this binary between global North and South is not only quite unhelpful, but probably deeply problematic in some ways. So forgive me that I use that terminology. But I also want to hopefully provoke some lines of thinking that are a bit different or extend on what has been discussed already. So next slide, please. Um, very quickly, I'll, and I'll do the first one very quickly now. Um, I don't want to recapitulate things we've discussed already, but there are a couple of things that came up that I think are worth um, reiterating and reframing perhaps. So I'll talk a bit about some natures and the implications of, of what we see with this inequity in, in existing research partnerships. And then I want to talk a bit about what I think some of the recommendations are, particularly for Northern funders and also researchers at Northern institutions in, in those partnerships. Um, so, um, and in doing so, I'll be speaking across the kind of four themes that, that we've been discussing um, in the different groups. But I'll try and draw on some examples from my own experiences. So in particular, there was a uh, partnership I had with an institution in Ghana, um, Australian Development Agency funded, um, which I think there's some examples. I think. So next slide, please. On the nature and implications, I had these five things to say. Um, I'll be really quick on the first one uh, because uh, Dr. Kwaku covered it nicely and Sarah has really, really addressed it as well. But I think... When it comes to this idea that because the money comes from the north, there's an ability to shape the agenda and to determine the conditions through which the research takes place, has a few 
significant ri risks. It's not just that it happens. There's there's more to it than that. And I think it precludes these other imaginaries and outcomes. We've heard about different ontologies and epistemologies, big words, some of which I don't really fully understand despite teaching on this stuff. But I think we know what we really mean, that it's about how we understand the world, the different ways of knowing, the different kind of registers of power, the different ways that relationships, relationality matters to social order, and how things like the spiritual realm and yeah. the trees matter fundamentally to people's ontological ways of knowing the world. And if that's written out because of a decision by a donor to set four priorities for the research, and that is a path dependency, then that's potentially really problematic. I'm really re reiterating things that have been said on that point. For a second, that it misses the point often. It, it means that we we have projects researching tangentially into areas which may be broadly of interest to partners, but, but not really. It's not the core, it's not the crux of the issues that people are animated by and interested in, but actually they've shape-shifted and bent in order to fit the, the funding goals. Um, and so from my experience, certainly um, some of that ontological and epistemological stuff has shaped methodologies, ways of knowing the impact questions, questions around outcome and impact are perennial in this space, right? We're all grappling with this constantly. But if we set our methods in a way which defines success in a certain way, then of course it forecloses on any other way of knowing the impact on people's lives and well-being. Um, and so in the, the project I worked on with our Ghanaian partners, um, it really relied on um, the co-creation, co-design process to ensure that we didn't take missteps in that in that regard it was entirely at the discretion of those putting the bid together the framework it was almost like we had to work against the, the, the conditions the guidelines for the for the grant right it, i don't think it needs to be that way but um so moving on quickly i think something else that came up yesterday that this idea that precarity um vulnerability or uncertainty gets locked in through this process so um, Kweku mentioned about the potential that funds are redirected with a short notice or with no recourse, like due to COVID or Ukraine or so on. But also this idea of, and it's, this is more practical and, and more common, I think, that the devaluation of currencies that came up in discussion has a huge impact. And again, um, for, and, and this happening after the award of, of resources, right? So we, in our project, we calculate with our partners in Ghana, uh, a budget for them in US dollars. Made sense for them, completely fine for us to work with them. The Australian dollar tanked against the US dollar. Mm -hmm. It was pretty stable in Ghana, actually. There wasn't that. I know that is not the case today, <laughs> but um, at the time. And so we, we lost 30% of the value of our overall grant. And we had to skew that. We didn't have to. We, we chose to not let that affect the partner's budget. But that was a choice and that was on ours. And that was not something that the, the donor was flexible about. Lots of reasons for that, but it's it's something which is real. Um, this next point about um, the outputs and the um, the publication thing has been has been mentioned a lot. I think it's really important though that access to the, the publications in the first place in order to produce publications. Um, is clearly a problem that comes with it. I'll return to that in my recommendations. And I think all of this really reinforces or reinscribes this kind of two-tiered system. And, and somebody said yesterday um, in a really powerful way that all of these things really erode morale. They eat into good faith and, and kind of goodwill between partners. And there's this idea that it reinforces this idea of stay in your lane. I think um, that's what you said yesterday, it really resonated. And, and I, I can see how that's so, so important. So um, I, I'll move on, but the last one there, which is another point really is this perverse impact that it has. It, it encourages, it incentivizes people to work with Northern partners. And I think that it comes at the expense of additional South-South exchange and, and relationship building. I think that's that's problematic. And next slide, please. So what can we do about these things, those and others that have been mentioned already? 
Well, a few ideas for what I think funders can do. And I should caveat this by saying, I understand the limitations and the, the structures within which funders are working and foreign ministries and the political imperatives that they have to report up to political matters. All of this is said with that in mind, but I think we're at a point where if we want to take this seriously, we need to interrogate and then challenge some of those structural um, issues. So some of this is from what you said yesterday. Some of it is is a bit of um, of my own thinking. So supporting in a meaningful way southern agency in the generation of proposals and 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 eschewing that lopsided northern driven agenda in, in in the most simple sense and i think that kind of speaks for itself but what it means is that donors funders i think need to be willing to make big steps and big shifts in order to make that a reality um, I'll come on to some examples of what, what they can be. A more micro level thing, and this perhaps flows from there, is that it's these other bits and pieces which are enabling, which are often left out of budgets or are disallowed in the funding calls. And they came up often yesterday. So dissemination and research uptake activities. Much of the engagement is happening throughout the course of the research project, but there's always inevitably a need at the end to speak to implementing partners and engage with policy communities, often not accounted for um, sufficiently in budgets. I think there's a way that funders can open up and encourage more yeah. attention to that element in the way that the funding, the budgets are allowed. Um, access to e-journals has been mentioned so many times, but I think it's clear that it needs to be explicit, it needs to be encouraged by donors, and it needs to be recognised that it's otherwise a self-fulfilling uh, you know, a vicious circle that um, is self-defeating, sorry. Um, writing retreats in lieu of buyouts. This was a comment by Dr. Christine, yeah. Dr. Christine yesterday. It's a great example that I think is a workaround. I think we need to, and we're always doing this anyway, when we respond to calls, we get creative, we try and be innovative, we find ways to place things in certain budget lines. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's as applying our kind of, wit and, and will to, to to make the work possible. But there are ways of doing this and exchanging ideas on that in places like this, I think is really important. But the donors need to incentivize that. If host institutions in Africa, in Asia, wherever it may be, are rigid and they don't allow for buyouts, there's many other examples like this, but this is a good one. Then you need to find ways to nevertheless support the researchers to do the work and not have them work double time and not on the weekends. It, it can't be that way. It needs to be, it needs to be done. And, and lastly then, and I kind of mentioned it, holding space for discussions about these issues. Donors, it's really difficult for them to fund talk shops, right? Like we've had it, we've all had it. But they're, not talk, they're not talk shops if they're a fundamental part of untangling some of these dynamics and addressing and tackling head on the, the power dynamics at play. And I think this is a great example of it. I think others where there's more of an exchange between North and South or whatever we want to call it and the composition of the room is a bit different. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, you get my point there. Um, okay. Um, incorporating pathways for, for sustainable financing. I think this is something that we hear a lot about from Western donors, but I don't know that it's um, followed through on good, in good faith. I think there needs to be, the, the power of the donor needs to be applied to, and, and leverage of the donor needs to be used in order to, to encourage host governments, uh, partner governments, but also partner institutions to bend a little bit and say, well, actually, maybe we can create a second phase of this project, which becomes conditional on certain outputs and, and, and impacts in the first phase, but that needs to have embedded in it a follow-on plan. It needs to have the private sector engaged in order to fund phase to co-fund phase two, and there needs to be some phase three. I think it's easier said than done, but more needs to be done in that regard. And if the donors are not doing it, then we can't expect the, the researchers to be doing that on their own. Um, and this is something that I think has also been said, but it, there has to be a shift in the calls from donors to be, and the SDGs 
for all of their ills and all of the deep problems with the sustainable development goals, they made development about a global set of issues and a global set of challenges. Yet we still have questions about the South and people doing research on the global South. There's no need. It, it, it shouldn't be that way. It's a legacy and it's a really a deeply harmful one. Okay, so with the, my remaining 30 seconds, let me go on to the final slide. Because I think what we talked yesterday, um, I'll finish by reminding us that it's not actually about what the Northerners can do. I think it's actually about ownership and, and agency within the global South as well. This, this is my presentation for now. But individual agency, what we can actually do within those structures and what people can do to, to act. We shouldn't put it all on the donor. We shouldn't put it all on the institutions because we can move. So very quickly, four things. First, I'm a journal editor. It's not the best journal in the world. In fact, it's pretty sketchy sometimes, I'll be honest. But, <laughs> but nevertheless, we have rankings. We have an impact factor. People will look at it as something that's appealing. I think we need... I, I try, but it's individualized, right? It's, it's, it's personalized as to whether I choose um, appropriate reviewers to review an article, which it's clear is navigating reduced access to journals, limited engagement with certain debates, and, and there's, a, a, there's a sympathy and a, and a kind of sensitivity that's needed by individuals. If, if we have that privilege and we're in the gatekeeper roles, then we need to apply that. Similarly, when it comes to those on boards, thankfully I'm not in these roles, but if you're on a committee for a big association or an international studies association or something, thinking about moving conferences to places where people can get to them. Yeah. It's a big grievance for people, right? The visa issue in Canada and ISA recently, it, it's dreadful, an absolutely abhorrent situation. Um, but I should say, it's not always easy for people to get visas to come to Africa either. <laughs> so we shouldn't think it's a one-way street or a simple, but we need to be real about it. We need to be serious about saying, well, actually, if we want equity, then we need to address some of those things. They're stuck. They're stuck. And lastly, then, walking the talk when it comes to publishing. I spoke with a couple of people. It's clear that people in the room are already interested in, whether it's because of promotions and so on, but in peer-reviewed journal publishing, like that's not something that people are necessarily pushing back on or struggling to see the merit of. But this idea that everyone is incentivized, encouraged to go for these top tier journals that become then paywalled and, and so on, but also have these expectations around how you write for them is a problem that we, re, re, we reproduce as partners. We, by us, Doing that, whether it's in our co-authored work or our individual work, then we're double speaking. As I think we need to be serious about publishing in open access ourselves. We need to be serious about fighting, but reading first, reading more of the work produced globally everywhere, and then citing and referring to and using and applying those ideas. Because I think that's a bit of lip service at the moment too. That's, that's problematic. Um, so really now finishing up, um, yeah, there was another point about uh, trying to address that risk of people becoming exploited as data extractors in the in the South and, and utilizing the North, but no time for that now. I think in the end, the individual moves that the Northern researchers can do are about being, the, to, to use those adequate, being the change you want to see, actually living up to those ideals and walking the talk. So funny cartoon about it. Okay, so to wrap up, what does it mean? Well, I've already mentioned the uh, final slide, thank you. Ino Ezio, as they say in Nigeria, <laughs> this is, none of this is easy. None of this is easy. Um, and it involves trade-offs. It's not like we just need to realize what is required and then do it. There, there are trade-offs. And so for donors, it means increasing the risk tolerance. It means that there might be some bad stories in the tabloids. I know stories in the UK where I'm from where a terrible pro a project where it was abused by one individual, the bad apple kind of sure. idea um, that was mentioned to me. It can be splashed across the headlines, taxpayers' money wasted, and it undermines a whole lot of capital built up. There needs to be a higher risk tolerance and a, and a more proactive way of getting out in front of that. It's a PR campaign in some way as well, because if the, if the wins can be demonstrated by taking the risk, then it will become more sustainable to keep that model. 
but that that's necessary. And for researchers, it also means maybe taking a hit. If you go and publish open access or in journals that are new and fresh and from the global south, then yeah, your tenure track might get delayed or your promotion might not happen as soon. But that's the walk in the talk. And that's and, and they're big trade-offs, they're big payoffs. So I think that, and I promise this is a truly the last yeah. thing I'll say. <laughs> I think tackling the inequity in some of these partnerships, we can do things. There is some incremental things that can be done that will improve the situation gradually and incrementally. But ultimately, when it comes to the Northern aspect, if Northern agencies are serious about decolonizing development, about um, addressing inequity in research partnerships, then it needs to be more transformational and, and radical. It can't be the rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, right? It's <laughs> like the, the ship still sink. Um, I think we, the other picture, of course, is the baby in the bathwater. So I don't think we need to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I think there's a lot that I, I've learned so much and benefited from the mutual learning that I've seen and benefited from through these partnerships. So I think we need to um, encourage and work towards um, that kind of transformational change and put pressure on at the points of leverage we have and in the partnership, put pressure on, on those actors that can make changes, albeit within some pretty strict parameters. I should really leave it at that, but I'm happy to take questions and happy to hear comments afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. I'm supposed to summarize these two presentations before the Q&A. It's quite difficult and I'm not gonna really summarize, but just uh, perhaps draw up a few and that caught my attention that went across the two really, really excellent presentations. They were really great. Thank you so much for that. Um, transformational change. Uh, I think that's, that's something that both of the presentations are calling for, but I think both of them also in a way allows us to see what can we do gradually within the funding conditions and the hierarchies that are everywhere uh, at the moment. I think um, one thing that um, is significant here is the hierarchies of knowledge systems and the hierarchies of what counts as science and knowledge, right? I think that is a really good place to start. And I think you both touched on it because as long as positivistic, wet and driven Western philosophers, and they are also mainly men, I can say as a woman <laughs> from the global north, as long as they remain hierarchically at the top of the iceberg and in some disciplines, the only valid science, I think it's really difficult to move forward on a lot of the other issues. Um, and I'm sitting in the, in a in a research uh, committee myself, looking at applications. And if those committees, like you're saying with the donors, are also looking uh, for Bourdieu and Foucault and you know these uh, white male philosophers in order to validate whether a research application is research, uh, then we are reproducing those kind of uh, hierarchies even at that level, and there will be gatekeepers at the different ranks. So I think that's one uh, different ontologies, forms of knowledge for sort of knowing the world as you are talking about as well, Charlie, is, is, is really key. And some of it is very practical. I mean, if you are studying a particular topic uh, in a particular context, you also read the literature that's written uh, not you know, only by people maybe within your already existing network, but also uh, uh, by scholars in, in that context, or <clears throat> maybe a Japanese who writes about, I don't know, herder and farmer conflicts in Namibia. You know, I mean, we need to also think about the literature that we are in, engaging with. That's, I think, a quite practical uh, first step uh, in, that, uh, in that direction. Um, and then um, I also think the other point, um, that is really interesting um, that was brought up is this uh, lack of attention to context. Uh, so of course I'm a trained anthropologist, so we have to do like long-term in the field work and really take context into consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of other problems then in the global competitiveness uh, of science that you mentioned, uh, Sarah, 
Uh, but there is still a lot of research. You gave the excellent examples uh, also, Sarah, in your slides. A lot of research that's funded from the Global North that could be done anywhere. You know, you look at research applications, you're like, you forget almost as you read through the research application, whether you are in Ghana or you are in Indonesia. Uh, so this attention to context that you brought up, Sarah, I think is really, really important. Uh, there are lots of other things here. I think the last thing uh, I just wanted to that caught my attention uh, is this uh, thinking in terms of global problems and global issues. And I think I also maybe mentioned it yesterday, but I just want to underline that again, because I think that's also a way of dealing with these colonial rooted hierarchies uh, that are everywhere, as you say, Sarah, is to think about the research that we're doing, the problems that we are identifying, not as confined to a global south or a global north, global south dichotomy, but something that actually goes beyond those borders. And then we are also back to the funders that these restrictions on what countries we can do research in, and it has to be in one country, and if it's two countries, you have to have a really, really good idea, but actually opening up uh, what the topics are and how you put together a research project is, is goes back to also these kind of calls. But otherwise, I mean, I think for both of you, um, I think there's a lot we can do within the structures that are there, but we also need to be, you know, be flexible in the practical uh, ways we do it and then slowly pushing uh, these agendas. So I think that was, yeah, it was not a complete summary, but just the things that caught my uh, attention. And then I just want to say one thing uh, on the finance part, uh, which is also something that we both brought up. There's the question of overhead, and I don't want to open a Pandora's box, <laughs> but in the Danita project, for example, still we have 44% overhead for the Northern institutions, and we have 20 for the South. I have no idea why. But I think these are also, again, embedded in erroneous contextual understandings and hierarchies. I think it's a really good example of that. Because, for example, my own institution in the Global North, we already have a total perfect setup with financial accounting and do 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 and they've tried to manage these projects for years. Why are we getting 44% when a research institution or university in the Global South has to maybe go out and hire an accountant to be able to deal with these very complex forms of the uh, So I think that is, it's like a very small practical example of how something has just gone wrong somewhere in the presumptions that we have of, of these kind of partnerships. All right, thank you. I think uh, okay. anybody will present yeah. there. For pinpointing some issues uh, which emerging from the two presentations. So now I'm opening the floor for the comments, questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Anita. Uh, Dr. Sally and my brother Kwame. Or shall I say, my Ghanaian brother Kwame, for these very uh, excellent reflections. Uh, listening to the two present, uh, presentations and, of course, the discussions yesterday, I mean, gives one, um, you know, I mean, it's obvious that. We, or all of us here, are very much committed to transforming the imbalances and the power dependency that the two speakers uh, spoke about. And of course, even for providing this platform in the first instance. But I think there are other critical stakeholders, you know, who need to. Um, have access to these resources. Yesterday, now we spoke of our political masters uh, back in Africa, and the reason why they show so much little interest in research in Africa. And we thought, what are we not doing right? So we asked the question: How do we communicate our research findings to the political class? So it became obvious that only well, the political class does not appreciate what we do, and uh, perhaps because of how we communicate research findings, then they have no interest to support what it is that we do. So the question then was, how do we communicate better? 
listening to listening to both the presentation and of course uh, you know reflecting back on the whole question around intermediaries yesterday what you get the impression that's the degree to which all these conversations go in terms of the feedback loop to what extent do northern stakeholders at a political level also get to understand all these conversations we are having. I think it would be very useful that uh, such reflections are also made available one way. I know it's very difficult, but then to the extent that they also have very, you know, uh, significant influence in terms of how, uh, you know, this transformation is brought about through the materi materialities that it provides to make that transformation happen, then it is significant that uh, perhaps we reflect in terms of how we can also be better to the political masters in the north, but also better to the political masters in the south. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe you can take maybe like four questions and then respond, Charlie. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, inside as well. Yeah. Oh. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, for these presentations, I also found them very, very inspiring. And I just have two or three very short comments uh, or questions. One is, I mean, of course, we can also shop for funders, right? I mean, sometimes we do have a choice. And right now, it not I have very few positive things to say about EU, but one of the things that they've actually launched now is consortia where you have to have African universities as equal partners. And you can apply for money for bringing your partners from African universities to Europe or the other way around. So this is something we really need to look into how we can use. I mean, because we already have the network here, of excellent people who, again, there has to be a, a set number of European partners in the consortium since it's EU money, but nevertheless, it does open up in a different way. Uh, and then about open access, I think one of the inequalities uh, about that actually at this point is who can publish open access? Because I was, uh, I mean, it was really, we just published an article um, open access and I had funding, I had it in my budget, so I could pay $3,700 or something like that. Who can do that? I mean, when I'm publishing my, my own articles with one part or whatever, I, I can't pay that money, right? Out of my own pocket and my universities, they say, oh, oh yeah, definitely open access. You have to publish open access, but they're not going to cover it, right? So, so I think this is really major now because what is happening is that Denmark as a country or Holland or whatever, they negotiate with Springer or Elsevier or whatever that they their university employers, that was what I mentioned yesterday, can publish for free open access, right? Or the university somehow, or the state has paid for it. But that to require, that's again, completely unequal in the sense that if your country is not paying those ridiculous fees, you can't publish open access. And then to the reading, Charles, uh, Charles I, I have a question because my, my biggest, I mean, we can use our network here, but but uh, my biggest challenge is that when I have professors in Nigeria, for example, suggest when I teach the non-aligned, I'm an historian, sorry. When I teach about the non-aligned movement, I want you know perspectives also from African countries. So I have good colleagues in Nigeria, they send me references and I can't access them, mm. right? So it's like the, the other way around that he has to send me uh, PDFs uh, because so, so there's also something about I mean, certainly in our networks here to to share those references and maybe even yeah PDFs or printed copies of them. So um, anyway, those are, okay. Sorry. Yeah, let, the point that she has raised about universities from Denmark you know, getting access to open journal isn't that what we were saying yesterday? Now the ordering in the publication, if the Danish researcher is number one on our publication, that could be an opportunity that we can get the free access. But if I am number one, that could cause a problem. Maybe you can answer. No, no, it's no, just that you still have to keep it with, with yeah, the, the, no, I can just be yeah. corresponding author. Yeah, yeah. I don't have to be first. Okay. But it still means that you, you need exactly. me, right? Yeah. Or you exactly. need somebody. That's, that's, the, point that's, the, that's yeah. the point I'm yeah. making. That's the point I'm making. You still need 
that yeah. northern yeah. partner, isn't yeah. it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. the point. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for the nice presentation from Faz yeah. and Sarah. Now, my only mm -hmm. question or comment is about engagement of the private sector. Yesterday, in our discussion, we saw that uh, we got a very good approach from the Faso. The engagement of uh, private sector uh, has brought a very good rewards. Some students would get a scholarship. But I don't know from other groups and from other experience, what of the, if we involve the private sector, maybe we can go to the funding or also it will be a platform where our research findings also can get a, uh, to be heard and people could understand also we as researchers what uh, we are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Charlie and Sarah, please, would you like to start? Sarah, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for these submissions. And the, the, the summary could not have been more perfect. I wish you had done it. No, <laughs> it was wonderful. Yeah, so without wasting time, there were thanks everybody for the issues you've raised. The issue of communicating better to politicians, even in the other countries, mm -hmm. is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know, like, I'm usually a recipient of UKI right funding, and we have had, especially when they were after COVID. And then the way in Ukraine, mm -hmm. we had to go into those negotiations to show the impact of our research. Because the UK government decided to recall all funding for projects that had started, mm -hmm. but also then for those that have started, we cut funding by more than 50 percent. Now I had a running grant of 600,000 pounds. I am a humanities person. I'm a mm -hmm. political scientist, but in gender studies and with a PhD in health system, so that is okay. But for mm -hmm. colleagues who were in the sciences who had been ordered for reagents to begin if things running and equipment, they had to stop there. But of course, there was that kind of engagement. So normally our colleagues, the Northern Research Partners, do engage with the state, with the governments that give them funding. And that's why it's important that we raise these matters than actually being so nice because Danida has given us money and we have seen. In our group yesterday, Annette was there and she said some of the challenges she has is we southern researchers are not open with our northern partners. Mm -hmm. We may dump about what we are not happy about, but you don't articulate it. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we articulate these matters. It's not a sign of rudeness, so that our northern partners may actually communicate to their governments, in as much as we also communicate to our governments. So it's very, very important. There's an issue you raise about the northern, the, of course, now there's the guild in the European universities, there's NIH. In, the UK universities, and there's Arua on the African continent. Mm -hmm. So there's this partnership that is happening, but also, and I'm, I head an Arua center, so we are among the privileged. But there are two things I've noted with the partnership, which are the other don funding agencies are beginning to raise. One, Arua is like the big tigers on the continent, the 15 top-notch research, intensive research-led universities. I think now we're expanding to have two with the University of Dar es Salaam on. And uh, so we are already creating a tire, so people are beginning to raise that and say maybe that is not right. Mm. But also you have the guild is another tie of European universities and the NA I think around 15 also top. So we are dealing amongst ourselves. One thing I've observed, it is highly privileged in science because we want to help African countries to be to do nanotechnology, high level particles and material science. And of course, a lot of it privileges the South African universities. So their governments have the kind of infrastructure. We come on board as center nodes. Some of the centers we have in our sub-Saharan African countries is inequalities, mm -hmm. poverty, cities, urban cities, and housing, identities, which I had. And we, we enjoy being there, but already we have to ask those critical questions. <laughs> well, it's not all rosy. So we have to be attentive to what is happening and uh, see what is it we are creating as a leak tire of this kind of universe. Because we can also reproduce inequalities on the continent. But now I think we are being forced to have to come on board with other non arua universities so as to give support. But then you also have the other universities asking, why do you want to be our agents? We can also reach the donor by ourselves. But the problem is if Arua has already captured the donor, that donor is not available to any other African university. That's not in the Arua network. And to be the Arua network, we pay $10,000 a year. So, so anyway, 
And if you have a center, you pay another 10,000. You must give the center 50,000 dollars. Mm -hmm. So you have, this is a very expensive project. Okay. Publication for open access, that is very, very good. But I just wanted to add that uh, I also happen to be a, a general editor for the Advances and Global Health Journal, which is for University of California. So we are around five series editors. But what I've also observed with other journalists is, is if the African researcher is the first author, they can give you a waiver because you're located yeah, in the global yeah. So if we are to explore equity issues, mm -hmm. is if, for example, the Danish scholar is the first author on one paper in a project, mm -hmm. let the African scholar be the first author on the next paper. Mm -hmm. Because if African scholars in the global south are first author, <laughs> Chances are that they will get a, a waiver or a subsidized cost. So those are some of the things we can explore too. Yeah, so the rest is about access to papers and the private sector. The private sector is wonderful, but normally it also comes on board with particular things. Yeah, like if Shell wants to understand how best to reduce pollution, they will finance a research chair in a university to do that. The challenge with our countries in Sub-Saharan Africa is that our industry is not very well developed. Yeah. So you don't get research chairs coming from industry into the academia for to fund research. And okay, you get them a lot in South Africa and the global north, but you don't get them there. So at the end of the day, those of us who have benefited from that, you end up with research funding from Shell to understand how best to do that. And then maybe the other company and then the other company. And it's really going to be humanity stuff, which is okay and wonderful, but also the interests are for so it's to find out how people are going to uptake this product. So this is not to dampen people's views, but to say how can we be more intentional about this matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sarah, yeah. I think it's one yeah. yeah. There's a, yeah. a great adage that everything there is to be said yeah. has been said, but not everyone has said it yet. So I can now repeat <laughs> just no, I won't do that. <laughs> um Kweku, I think it's a great point. I'm super uh, it's an essential and integral element of a systemic approach to addressing these issues. There's a great, um, uh, we can do some promotion for you guys, what's the, uh, for, um, the Danish International Institute of International Studies has a policy brief that was co-authored by maybe even some of you in the room, I don't know, there's a long list of co-authors, um, but it's a great example of trying to translate some of these ideas through for a policy community. Maybe you could say something more about where that went if anyone has ever read it you know and and this sort of takes me to the point i want to make about this is what you all face we all face is big reporting kind of requirements to report up upwards accountability to donors but they never report back to us right about whether the work is useful whether it's led to some kind of impact the things that our universities want us to report on all the time. But by the way, there's not much of an obligation or a sense that they're locked into that because they're too busy, right? And they're too important to do that. But why? If 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 we want to be serious about changing this, then maybe there should be some sense of mutuality there. That would be more of a partnership. That's the suggestion. But um on the um open access thing, yeah, like my point it probably didn't come across clearly enough, but I was suggesting really. That just needs to get written into the budget so that doesn't become a, an inequity, a, a question of who has access to resources if that is built in. Some funders do allow for that. So the, the question is, well, then you go forum shopping, if they're the ones, and if enough people do that, then maybe other funders might start changing their behavior. The Norwegian do it, for example. Sorry? If you don't have external funding. Oh, of course. Right. So there's always contingency, but what 